One of the biggest complaints with television is how much louder commercials are from regular programming. This has been going on since about the 1960s. It's difficult for television stations to fix this problem, but you can for less than $200, and the difference to your television audio is amazing. I'll take you through the step-by-step -step process. Hi, I'm Scott Bain. They call me the old farmer. This is not the realm of the typical topic for the channel. I believe if something is annoying, either fix it or get rid of it. This is the case with loud commercials. To be honest, Mrs. Old Farmer and I don't watch much television anymore. When we do, it's usually the older programs like Wagon Train or the Dick Van Dyke Show. But without this process, we could be bombarded with loud commercials. The easiest fix would be for television manufacturers to build into the TV a simple control for adjusting audio beyond the volume control, such as an AGC or compressor. An AGC is an automatic gain control. It deals with the overall level, such as when turning across the channels, a TV channel may have a lower volume or a louder sound. An AGC unit will keep this on an even keel. But let's get into a little history so that you can understand what is going on. Back in the 1960s, audio compressors were starting to work pretty good, and both radio and television stations started adding them to the audio chain in order to smooth out differences in audio and also bring the audio levels up so that they can be a bit louder. You can especially hear it in FM music stations. They want it as loud as it can be and eliminate the quieter portions of music by making them even louder. Part of the reasoning is that a louder station to the public is a better sounding station. The second reason is that most times the radio is used in the car where external noises can interfere with music and most importantly the commercials. Television is a little different. TV is not afraid of allowing dynamic range to occur in audio. Dynamic range means that quiet and louder sounds can both be present. Even though the peak audio will show at 100% or saying it another way, 0 dB or 0 decibel. A negative 3 on the meter means that the audio is 3 dB quieter than the maximum loudness of 0 dB. Television stations may run an average audio level of 60 to 80 percent, while the peak audio reaches 0 dB or 100 percent loudness. In broadcasting back in the days where AM radio was the king, the audio was set at either 0 dB or plus 4 dB in equipment. This would happen when the volume control or potentiometer, or in slang, the pot, was wide open. Everything was designed to reduce from maximum loudness as needed, where in the home it's amplification of the audio to the proper level. So why do commercials sound louder than programming? It's very annoying. First of all, no audio can be louder than 100% or 0 dB. Remember how I said television audio on the average ran about 60 to 80% audio? An audio compressor squeezes the audio loudness, something like squeezing a damp sponge. Depending on how much you squeeze the audio, more the peak levels are reduced to the average of 60 to 80% range. Let's just say for conversation 60%. The audio runs at 60% so that no audio will go over the 0 dB level of loudness. It's a cushion or headroom. Think of it as a glass of beer. You don't pour all the beer into the glass, you give some headroom for the foam. This is the same for audio. So with a compressor squeezing the audio to 60%, you may be able to safely raise the average audio level to 95% 
without going over the 0 dB maximum level. This 0 dB level was originally set by the FCC, and in past days a station could be fined for running audio over this 0 dB level. Nowadays, as long as you don't interfere with another station, they really don't care. But the standard has been ingrained into the industry. So if you can make your audio 35% louder, for those who know ratios, I'm keeping it simple. The audio is now half again as loud without actually going over the 0 dB limit. So when referencing peak audio, the commercial is not any louder than programming. This is what TV stations have been saying for years, and they're correct. However, the viewer isn't talking about peak loudness. They don't even know what it is. All they know is that the audio in commercials are louder. What they didn't know is that they're talking about is that the average loudness is higher. So why do advertisers do this to their commercials? They are trying to force the message into your brain, and they will do it any way that the law allows. Now let's step into the home side of things. Even before TV sets had an external plug, I've been bringing out my trusty soldering iron and adding a headphone jack to the old console TV. Then I ran it to my stereo. Even with the quality of TV speakers today, a good stereo system can make the audio sound better. That's why movie theaters use a whole bunch of 15-inch speakers placed around the seating area so that there'll be plenty of sound. And as you know, movie theaters use a lot of dynamic range. They like seeing audiences getting startled with loud noise. So for us, what can we do at home to knock these loud commercials down to size? I'm not going to get into surround sound. I prefer 8-channel discrete audio. Anything more, and also with surround sound, is a waste of good sound. 8 discrete channels mean each channel is separate. You have a left and a right front and back, which is 4-channel or quad sound, which never took off because they tried to fake it. And folks thought true quad sound was that faked quad sound, and it was terrible. Then you have two channels overhead and two channels below. With digital, it's possible to do a true octa sound that will seem as if you were truly there. Sometime, if you can, stand where the conductor stands for an orchestra or a choir. The audience hears nothing in comparison. It's amazing. Well, enough with this rabbit hole. If we run TV audio to the stereo, we can put our own audio compressor between the TV audio out spigot and the in spigot of the stereo and do our own squeezing of the audio. This will knock those loud commercials down to where they should be. Let me do a bit of sidebar here. Back before cable and satellite TV, there were four TV channels. And one of those didn't count because it was first the NET station, which later became PBS, which pulled no more than 5% of the viewership. More often it was 1%. Maybe there was an independent station in a bigger market that wouldn't do much better. The real viewership was among ABC, which came from the old NBC Blue Radio Network. Then there is CBS, and then NBC, which came from the NBC Red Radio Network. They had a pretty good lock on the commercial market, so through the NAB, the National Association of Broadcasters, standards were set. During the daytime, a station shared with the network 22 minutes of non-programming time per hour. That means commercial, public service announcements, and programming promotions. The exception was those half-hour infomercials. At night, it was only 12 minutes of non-programming time. The local station shared this time with the network. During prime time, the local station usually got four minutes per hour and even got paid enough money from the network so that the station could break even with expenses of a basic 
No Frills Station. The local CBS affiliate in my area back during this time charged up to $1,000 for a 60-second commercial. And it was worth it. The primetime viewership was unbelievable. Along came cable and satellite TV. The viewership was now divided between 200 channels, and some were very worthless channels that would not have any viewership. They were bundled in with a major cable channel. If you don't show the Mushroom Channel, you can't show the Kitchen Channel. I made up the names. This happened in radio, too. If you didn't run Dr. Dean Adele, you couldn't run the late Rush Limbaugh. Actually, I should say, if you didn't run Adele, your limbo contract would not be renewed. With all the competition for advertising dollars, and a lot of it was running at a dollar for a 30-second commercial, or the equivalent at the network level on cable, it was kind of hard to sell that $1,000 commercial. This also hammered the print media, too. This is what killed print. It was not the internet or digital. They just could not charge enough to put out the product they were putting out. For a newspaper, it takes some full and half-page ads to pay for the investigating reporter. And you are paying with subscription television to have all this yammering in your face. Advertisers will do what they can to drill into your head their message. That is why commercials are louder than programming. So the gloves came off with over-the-air TV. Prime time went to 22 to 32 minutes of non-commercial time in an hour. So folks did whatever they could to avoid the commercial load. But the commercials were still louder than programming. With commercials running in long breaks, something had to be done to stand out from the other commercials. Loudness is one of the features. So by putting an audio compressor between the TV and the stereo, those commercials are brought back down to the same level as the programming, and the programming will sound even better. So let's do some examples. I'll bring up on my computer screen uh, this waveform. First, let me say there will be a timing tick underneath the example of the music bed. When buying the rights to a production package to use, It's assumed that you won't be running the complete bed raw. In other words, in a way that someone else could steal the product without paying for the right to use the bed. Ergo, I'm using timing ticks. First, I peaked the audio to 0 dB. You can see just by looking at the waveform that the audio has been modified. The taller the form, the louder the sound. Notice when I put 12 dB of compression on the audio. It lowers the audio level by 12 dB. But the apparent loudness stays the same. Yes, you can hear that some of the instruments have been made louder, but the overall apparent loudness of the piece is the same. Now let's take another piece of this bed, compressed by 12 dB, then raise that same piece to 0 dB. Now this may not work on YouTube because they do weird things to the video and audio, but let's give it a try. It's no louder when based upon peak loudness. However, the average sound is much louder. I did these adjustments so that you could tell the difference. If I'm setting up my compressor for TV, I would do so in a way that the audio compressor and what I'm doing is invisible. If you're going to buy a compressor, 
make sure it's a stereo or two-channel audio compressor. You don't need to spend more than $200 for a unit. There are several within this range that are good units. I'll leave links below for compressors that will do the job, but I'm not recommending them, but they will do the job. Now let me show you my system. It's about $900 worth of equipment, brand new. It just smooths the audio a little bit better. The bottom unit is the audio compressor. This one has an audio expander. If the audio is too low, it brings it up. If you get this feature, be gentle with the audio. Otherwise, you will be bringing up hiss and other low-level sounds that will be very annoying. Another feature is a gate. Anything below a setting, which you decide, and the audio is cut off. Gates of this caliber are only good for cutting out that little hum that may be left when you turn everything off in the home system and the stereo is still on. Just turn it up a whisker to have it kill that little hum. The first step is to get the proper cables. Avoid using adapters. All it will mean is that you will have problems down the road. If you have gotten a compressor with XLR or Canon plugs, you will have to build your own cables to do it right. So I recommend go with a quarter inch TRS connectors. In everyday language, that's the quarter inch connectors common in past electronics. You should check with headphones that audio comes out the TV spigot that you think it does. Check first. Now, I will be saying mini plug, but it might be something else that connects to your TV. Purchase two sets of cable. One cable matches your TV set and the other matches the input of the uh, compressor. In other words, a quarter inch plug. So you need one from the TV to the compressor inputs, which are on opposite sides of the compressor. This cord is a stereo male mini plug that will plug into your TV. Make it something else if your TV uses something different. The other end will have two quarter inch mono male plugs or whatever the compressor has used for home use. The other cable will start with the two quarter inch male plugs that will fit into the outputs of the compressor. Most stereos use RCA connectors, so the other end of the cord will have two male RCA plugs. Have everything turned off so you don't blow your speakers. So for review, from a stereo mini male plug from the TV to the two male quarter inch plugs that are in the input jacks on the compressor. Now let's look at the tail end of the compressor where you will have two male quarter inch plugs inserted into the outputs of the compressor. Be careful about channel hopping. Don't plug the left into the right or vice versa. There are usually some indicators on the cable. For example, lamp cord usually has a smooth side and the other side has a ridge. Normal practice has the ridge as the negative side. It won't hurt anything but a pan of the audio from one channel to the other channel will be backwards from the video. Make sure when measuring lengths for your cables that you add a little extra for cushion. Maybe four feet extra should be enough for longer runs. On the back of the compressor, there may be one or possibly two switches that will show on one side of the switch something like a negative 10 or a negative 20 and on the other side, a plus four or some other number. There may be two switches, one for each side, or maybe just one switch. Put it in the higher number side. The knob position may be different on your compressor, so follow along with the names rather than the positions. Now look to the front of the compressor and turn inputs for both sides all the way down. Do the same with the outputs. Do this also to the TV and the stereo. If you can run your stereo with the speakers turned off, do so and use headphones plugged into the stereo. If on the front side there is no input knob, but one called threshold, turn that all the way clockwise. 
Now turn everything on and be prepared to turn off the stereo just in case sound comes blasting out of your speakers. Turn the compressor inputs and outputs on both sides to 12 o'clock. Turn the TV volume up by 25% from the lowest level. If everything is turned on, there should be lights flashing or meters bobbing. Now slowly turn up the volume on the stereo. If you turn everything up and there is not enough audio, then move the switches on the back of the compressor to the lower number. If the audio is way too loud, turn both compressor inputs and outputs to 9 o'clock. There is a switch, maybe on both sides, that says compressor or bypass. Push the button for compressor. There is one or two switches that says mono or separate. And the other position is join or some such thing like that. This locks both compressors to one channel so that there is not channel bouncing. It can make you dizzy if you have headphones on with the channel bouncing. We want both channels locked together for compression. It will not affect the stereo separation. I don't know which side is the main side and which side is the slave side for the compressors. It's different in every model, but I don't worry about it. By setting one side to match the other side exactly with the knobs. Turn the attack all the way counterclockwise to the fastest setting. Turn the release all the way clockwise to the longest setting. Now turn the ratio all the way clockwise to the largest number. If your compressor has a gate or an expander, turn them off for now. If you want to, you can play with them later after reading the manual. You won't hurt anything if you play with them. If you don't like what you hear, just turn them off. If you listen to the radio at normal volume levels in this room, turn to your favorite radio station and adjust the volume knob on your stereo to your normal listening level for the room. Now switch back to the TV on your stereo and adjust the outputs of the compressor, both channels so that the sound level is close to what you have when listening to the radio set at normal volume levels. We're getting close, folks. Adjust the input level on the compressor so the compression falls in the middle of the metered lights. There should be a switch on the front to change what you're looking at with the meters. Or it could be that you have two sets of lights per side. One always showing compression, well, there's a switch that will adjust another set of lights for either input or output levels. The optimum placement is to have everything in the middle. And that's true for the input and the output, too but you adjust to what you need. Now the other term instead of input is threshold. Threshold is a little different than input. Threshold is where the compressor will kick in and start compressing. The more you turn the knob counterclockwise, the lower will be the point where the compressor starts compressing. Some units are compressor limiters. A compressor works on a ratio of how much it will reduce the audio. At the threshold, a compressor may only reduce the audio by 10% or whatever you have available on your compressor. A limiter says no more volume or level. It's a brick wall that stops the audio from getting any louder. Remember, a compressor or a limiter will only reduce the audio level. Then there is a section that will amplify it back to normal levels. Read the manual and look at some articles on the internet and YouTube for more of an explanation on how audio compressors work. Just realize that the term compression is the wrong word when used with the digital realm. The term should be compacting. Compacting takes little divots out of the audio. Compression is the leveling of audio. Someone in computers 50 years ago didn't know what they were talking about and used the wrong word. Let's see if we can correct this error. MP3 audio is not a compression program. It is a compacting program that reduces the size of the file. There are similar compacting programs for videos such as MP4. Enough with my rabbit holes. Let's return to the topic. Now you can stop the loud commercials. As an additional bonus, when watching a movie, I think you will like the sound better, too. Play around with it a bit, but not when the family's watching television. 
it wouldn't be a bad idea to write the settings down as a reference. Have fun and enjoy. I want to again thank the folks who have subscribed to the channel. Thank you. If you're new, I hope you think there is enough value in what you see here to subscribe. Ring the bell and leave a comment. But also, this channel will not be for everyone. No channel can be. But let me ask that if you subscribe to any channel with less than 1,000 subscribers, and it's not the channel for you, hold off unsubscribing until there's a thousand subscribers. This is the level that YouTube may throw a little money into the pot. Once the goal is hit, it doesn't matter if the channel's subscription numbers drop, the mark has been reached, and the compensation process can begin. So thank you for watching. Well, this is the old farmer, Scott Bain. Be well. Be safe. Don't forget to click like and click subscribe on the Old Farmer YouTube channel. And thanks again for watching. Bye. The VFW National Home for Children, providing families of veterans and active duty military opportunities for growth and development in a nurturing community. Please consider a donation to help their children and families. Icy Road speaking.